So hello, welcome to this, the latest Books Crypto Club catch up on Zoom. It's Sunday, the 6th of June, 2021. And today we're going to be talking about whatever in the crypto world. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, do click on the subscribe, click the like button, click the notify, all the other good things that the YouTubers ask you for, because uh, that way you get to see future events or actually come along and join us in the future because we meet every, every Sunday, 5 p.m. till 6 p.m. on Zoom at this location. Chris, good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon, Gary. Yeah, hang on a second. Uh, there we go. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, another lovely day. Well, not quite so sunny, but... Oh, it's pretty, pretty nice around here at the moment. So, yeah. so I wonder how many people will be out sunbathing today rather than looking at the screens and working out what's going on in the crypto world. Possible, possible. Some people might be quite depressed. <laughs> it's been a really mixed uh, week, hasn't it, with pr prices going up and down and everything? Yeah, yeah I, mean, uh, I don't think... Uh, I think it's common in all markets at the moment. It's not just cryptos. Yeah. There's so much uncertainty everywhere. Um, uh, I think... Uh, and the banks are fighting hard against missing out on blockchain and, and the potential of loss of earnings. Could, could, could well be. Yeah, we'll, we'll see where that goes, definitely. Hey, Peter, I see you've joined us as well. well welcome aboard. Oh, He's on silent at the moment. He, he's on mute. Maybe, maybe he'll join us shortly. But Chris, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I, I think the general world economy is in an interesting place. So, oh, Peter, you've come off mute. Hello. Hi, how are you? Not too bad, thanks. This is the first time you've been to one of these sessions? Mm, second time I was on two weeks ago i think ah okay yeah that's good well welcome back hopefully we didn't scare you off too much from the, the previous one there and <laughs> as you probably realized from the last one we, we never really know what we're going to end up talking about with these kind of things um it's all, all things crypto really so we'll see how we go on hey fernando hello how are you oh he's just connecting as well yeah I, th I think it's one of those days where Zoom just says they're connected and then they're not, they're not actually, so it takes a bit of a moment. Yeah. So, yeah, Chris, we we're saying that the markets have been very interesting this week, haven't they? They've been going up and down and all, all over the place. Um, and, and it's the traditional finance ones are going a bit crazy as well, I think. I've, I've, yeah. I, was doing, I was doing a class the other week on um, coping with economic uncertainty. And I was showing the people, it was, it was in the Gulf states, try, trying to work out where we are in the economic cycle. I'm not actually sure. Well, but people are desperate to earn some sort of return on their money. And it, to me, uh, you know, this whole boom at the moment in SPACs is another risky, highly risky uh, dive, rather like some of these Dogecoin and... Um, Shibu coin things, they're, they're just up there for nothing, really. Yeah. Well, to, to, talking of Doge, we've got a, a real fan of Doge who's joined us. If um, JC's going to join us, are you going to come off mute, Fernando? Oh, <laughs> a real fan of Doge. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I thought it was Doge and Ripple are your two favorites. Yeah, for sure. You know. <laughs> I hate them like I don't know. It's, I mean, uh, Dodge is is it's Elon's playground, you know. But Ripple, I really hate, you know. Yeah. So, so, so I, was, I was just joking. For those who don't know, um, Fernando's on at, at least one other group that I'm involved in, and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of banter at times about um, Doge and Shibu and R Ripple in particular, uh, which generates a, a lot of interest. In. Uh, in it at all. I've got another joiners. Yeah. Ripple, Ripple, I think. Uh, Ripple, I think. Uh, I, I would. I'm expecting the next couple of weeks for something to come out. You know, because it's what already five months. Yeah, so four months, I think. Right. So well, I think we something well, out coming. Well, what's the latest on the SEC decision? Because I, I thought they're doing quite well. Yeah, so, it should be coming out. That's what I'm saying, you know. Okay. And uh, for the ones who expect anything, I don't know how the judge could avoid um, 
I mean, it passed the Howey test. There's no doubt about that. You know, when Ripple started, uh, they only had three servers. Uh, you can't pass that. It doesn't matter all the historical communications between SEC and, you know, about Bitcoin and Ethereum, what they consider crypto or not. The fact is, Ripple passes the Howey test. You know, mm -hmm. they had three servers they were selling. Uh, they control most of it, right? They're just basically selling selling and buying low and selling again and buying low. And that's what they've done for years, you know. So well, I, th I think that's something. Uh, Hussein, who has, hasn't joined us for a couple of weeks, he usually comes on. He's been listening into the SEC uh, court case because you can actually dial into it. I, I think mm. he was saying the other week, it's been really interesting that Ripple are actually, they, they seem to be trying to move things so that the SEC may actually reconsider the Howey test as being fit for purpose. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. So we, yeah. we've got a couple of other uh, new faces today. We've got Steve joined us. Hi, Steve. Oh, yeah. You're all right. It, it, it did initially say man shack or something, and I was trying to work <laughs> out. <laughs> That's probably good. This. <laughs> and That's Samuel as well. Hey, Sam. I mean, oh, I, I've unmused myself at last. Oh, it's just, oh, the amount of times uh, I have to tell people to do that at work. Hello, yeah. hello. Sorry, sorry to be slightly tardy. Um, I was just, uh, I was, I was going, out, I was out for a walk, and then I had my dinner. But uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. Hey, no, no, no problem. For, for those who've not been along before, um, these are pretty free flowing. I, I just encourage the conversation in whatever way we go. We sometimes talk about crypto, DeFi, NFTs, blockchain, whatever rocks people's boats really. So there's nothing fixed. All I do say is that if anyone has got any particular questions they do want to ask, let, let's make sure we get them covered. Um, okay. it, it then makes it worthwhile for, for people coming along on the call. Okay. All right, cool. Um, well, I don't know. I've, I'm, I'm, I've kind of like, even I'm hodling. I'm one of these really bad hodlers who just follows the market uh, incessantly. It's a really yeah. bad habit. It's a really, really bad habit. But I'm, I'm in for the long game, like 10, 15, even 20 years. I, just, I want to see increase on increase, really. Yeah. I'm trying to build a retirement pot. <laughs> well, the thing is, the, inter the interesting post someone made the other day, I think it was on Twitter, they pointed out, Anyone who bought Bitcoin four years ago or longer and who held uh, is in profit. S simple as that, the, the way the market's gone. No matter yeah. what point, even, even if you bought at the previously worst point of around about December 2017, I think it was, where it hit 20K and then it yeah. collapsed away, that anyone who's bought in the last four years it, it is ahead. So hodling does seem to be turning out okay, so that's good. So have you been, are you an active trader then or are you just um, look, oh. looking for long term? Um, well, actually, um, I've, no, I'm, I'm really looking for long term investments, but I've been, I've been um, you know, speaking to, the, is it Jason? Is he, is he there? I've been speaking to um, other people and like they've been doing spot trades. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get into leverage trade trading. I've done a lot of research on that recently and the risk to rule ratio isn't worth it um especially like with the 125x and the 100x mm -hmm. I mean, like it's that that is literally just a gamble so that's something i think i'll be uh staying away from um but i i'm at, I've, I've put some money into some kind of like altcoins that i will take out at the what well, when in about october when i think that the top of the bull run is going to hit Okay. Um, so um, I, put, I put into Tron the other day. I saw Bitboy. Bitboy uh, was shilling Tron, and um, I saw Coin Bureau um, was shilling um, Ren Rencoin as well. So when I see like those top YouTubers uh, shilling those low, those those uh, low altcoins, I tend to put about thirty to fifty pounds in. And okay. um, you know, if, if the bull market returns like I think it will. I think I'm looking at like a 10x really from from that that position potentially. I think everything just really relies on on Bitcoin. Um, to me alone, I think Bitcoin is uh, everything's tied to it. It's, it's the digital gold of the market. So when Bitcoin you know goes up, the altcoins go up by far more, and uh, when they go down, they, it goes down by far more. So we're just waiting for Bitcoin to kind of get through this uh, bearish trend, aren't we, at the moment and sideways trend. Well, we'll see where it goes. It's interesting you're talking about leverage trades because I always say le leverage trades are a brilliant way of getting you to lose your money faster. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're just really efficient ways of uh, getting to leave the market. And that's the thing. I, I don't know how much experience everyone on the call has got on this, but the reality is whether you're trading in crypto or shares or any other form of trading, about 80% of people lose money. Um, yeah. But the 80% the yeah. always think they're part of the 20% who do well out of it. So, mm. yeah. right, so Steve, t- tell us a bit about yourself. Where's your interest lie? <laughs> A um, bit of both. I've got half invested long term and then half I'm spot trading each day on the sort of riding the waves. It's going quite well so far, last couple yeah. of weeks. Yeah. Okay. So, Sam, you, you're saying you, th- you thought it was going to be um, the, the current um, da- downtrend ending in October, was it or something? Or you said the. the oh, uh, not uh, like. I think that, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to, uh, uh, to, to respond to your question. I think we'll hit the height of the bull run uh, October 25th. That's that's the date um, where I'm looking at most technical analysis when we've looked at previous bull runs and like each bull run is slightly longer than the last one and et cetera, et cetera. So um, looking at most, uh, I'm, I'm a historian by trade, so I do a lot of research. So I've researched a lot of different uh, te- techies and YouTube and different websites and 25th of October seems to be uh, the, the pinnacle of, of the bull run. So around that time, depending on what's going on with the market, I'm going to take out a considerable part of my profit, not all of it, but I'm going to take a considerable part of my profit out. I'm going to put it into, into stable coins and earn some interest. Okay. And then the, the, when that bear market starts, the bottom of the bear market from the last two bull runs has been one year, really. One year to the day at the, at the zenith of, of the of, of the bull bull hype or bull trend or blow off top whatever whatever you want to call it. So I think then I would look to reinvest my money to then get the maximum gain for the next um, bull market. But that said, the black swan of inflation will be here next year, and I think that is going to disturb the bear market. It will maybe make the bear market less uh, volatile. There will be less less of a swing downwards. Or perhaps it could extend the bull run. I mean, I, I mean, I just don't know. I just don't know. But there's certainly going to be some drastic market influences coming through next year because of inflation in America. It, it's interesting, at least, that you, you're one of the few people who's being very precise on dates. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, like, 25th of October. That, that's, you know, it, it's a challenge at times to get people to commit to which year they're talking about, let alone a particular <clears> date. So. So, you know, I can, can be go, precise. Go I can be precise as well if you want. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yours is now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can tell you. I can tell you that Bitcoin on the thirty-first of December is going to be around one hundred and ten and then twelve thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. So, and the the reason why I say that, I actually disagree with Sam, okay. because uh, what we've seen for a long time. Uh, until 2020, it's absolutely right what Sam said, yeah? Uh, But in 2020, things have changed because we start to see a lot... Before, it was just Kryptonians, you know, us doing stuff, you know, since 2011, 12, and buying Bitcoin or mining or whatever, yeah? But, you know, in 2020, a lot of other people joined the party, you know, institutional investors, traders that were not... Uh, crypto traders, right? And they've invaded the market and they have their own bots uh, as well. So what we will see is what we always see in the traditional markets. There's going to be highs and lows from now onwards. Uh, it, that's what's going to be, in my opinion. And then we saw also retail joining. Quite a lot of people buying not just Bitcoin, but any other well, shit coins, you know, <laughs> Doge and Shiba and all of those. But I think, Sam, you know, I, I, I thought the same as you when around January, February, I was looking at things and I thought, ah, this is going to go October maximum, beginning of November, yeah? Mm-hmm. But by March, end of March, beginning of April, I actually changed completely, you know, my, my, my thought process. I think we're going to continue to see a bull run until about May 2022. Wow. And you're right, because, because April, the next year, we start to feel the inflation, you know, and I think by May next year, we might see some, you know, things that are not going to be very good, not just from a, on the crypto markets, but, you know, in general, in all markets, you know. 
So it's my two cents. So do you, do you just think that that's uh, as uh, Sam was tying in, kind of like um, black swan type events or uh, hyperinflation potentially in, in the wider yeah, market? Hyperinflation is good for Bitcoin, you know, because people move the money away, you know, and this, mm. the, 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 it could happen like that, like Sam said, we don't know, yeah, but I am, I, I am of the opinion that in two weeks, maximum three weeks, we will see the Bitcoin really going back again to 60, 65. You know? okay. It might so drop now a little bit, yeah, but then won't stop. So that's kind of interesting because when it was dropping recently, I, I, th- I thought it would have a hard base at 35 and it briefly dipped a little bit below that. Um, just checking through, it actually made it down to th- 34 on the, what was that, the 5th of June? Oh, so, yeah, the... Um, but it briefly dropped a little bit lower, and I, I, I figured once it hit 35, that that would be the bottom line. It had bounced back up from there, and it does seem to be going up again. Well, I just wonder if anyone's got any thoughts. Is, is this it now? For if we get Bitcoin out of the way, because I, I agree that um, the other coins do tend to be linked to it in some way, although it's less and less now. Where it yeah. does generally be, you know, Bitcoin leads the way with a lot of them, and then there's a few outliers that behave just like random atoms of the universe. They, they just <laughs> work differently. Well, what's everyone else is thinking? Is, is Bitcoin hit the bottom now and it's just working its way up again? No, <laughs> no one got I any mean, thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I can kind of, I talk about the on-chain stuff. That's kind of, that's what we focus on. Um, mm-hmm. Trying to kind of look at the economic activity that happens on chain, hence the value it creates, um, which historically has been um, extremely good predictor of market tops and bottoms um, and you know, future directions of markets on a monthly basis so not just like trading day to day but trading month to month um, which is what we do um, it has been kind of an extremely good predictor and managed out to like, buy the strategy by some way but we are at the moment in a quite peculiar situation where kind of different signals that have never been wrong before are saying different things mm-hmm. um, so it's hard to say, like in the next couple of weeks, hopefully there'll be kind of a bit more clarity, either kind of other signals start turning bear, bearish or the kind of currently bearish signals start going neutral to possibly bullish. Like if the market can hold its stuff together in the next one or two months, it's more likely to go back up than it is to go down. Um, but on, on chain, kind of um, looking at on chain is kind of, yeah, looking quite precarious and rather unusual as. Um, it will be kind of a rather short bear market. And because, I mean, on kind of, if you look at more kind of chart and technicals, it looks more like the kind of um, halfway pause um, where you're going to shoot back up again. But on chase signals are potentially saying something different, which um, has never happened before, but essentially. Okay. Peter, Peter do, you, do you have a feel for how much activity is on chain versus off chain? So, how, how much of it is actually running through? The likes of Binance's pools and the, and the exchange pools, so that doesn't make it on chain until the eventual transaction. Do, do, do you yeah. have a feeling for how much it's done? Can't way? The, you can see the flows to exchanges and from exchanges, which can, can like in itself give kind of quite a lot of information as to kind of what's being traded, etc. And there's kind of a split between kind of US and non-US. US is considerably US exchanges are considerably more bullish than everything else, essentially. Um, which is kind of interesting is sort of kind of matching kind of exchange flows where it has been flown from kind of east to west um, and institutional um, buying for non-US entities called off um, Q4, whereas you know, for US entities that like, went through um, Q1 and then kind of cooled down from March onwards. Okay, so what, what kind of on-chain metrics are you using typically then? Do you, just in terms of volume flow, is it? I mean, it's volume flow, kind of minor fees, um, kind of a percentage of the holders and profits, stuff like that. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of this stuff in kind of buy nodes, uh, um, buy tree, glass nodes, um, kind of with data mine the hell out of all of that stuff. <laughs> okay, because it was interesting. I was on a call with someone the other day and they were talking about how uh, Bitcoin's very predictable 500 days after each halving 
And I said, you're kidding, aren't you? There's only been three halvings. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the previous two were done at a period when there wasn't enough volume to make anything out of it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I, I, was, I was just kind of curious where you're talking about minor fees as to are, are they very variable at the moment? Uh, well, at the moment, they've absolutely plummeted, which generally isn't, it's really not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, historically, kind of minor fees have been a kind of a very reliable signal where the market's going to when they start plummeting. It's not a good sign. Because does, doesn't that mean that some of the miners are going to switch to other coins and that kind of thing anyway? So you're going to lose the hash rate on it. Yeah. I mean, one thing that may have kind of had some effect is kind of um, the kind of the clamp down in China and a lot of them are having to kind of move. Um, but I mean, if the Bitcoin is generally kind of as we discussed, um, because it's such a large kind of proportion of the market, like if Bitcoin does badly, the rest of the market is sooner or later likely to follow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, they might kind of push over coins in the near term. In the longer term, a lot of them is going to get shut down if, like, mm-hmm. if it's um, a short beginning of a, of, um, a crypto winter or mini crypto winter, though it could potentially be a shorter one, potentially like we saw in 2019, where it was like six months and then it's kicked off again. Okay. One of the things that I want to highlight, Gary, and it puts into context, is that before before the first halving, already 10.5 million Bitcoins were mined. Mm -hmm. And people seem to forget that. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. so important to look forward and try to understand where are those Bitcoins? Yeah, because, you know, we can track them. And that's so key to understand what's going to happen in the next two years to Bitcoin, yeah? Well, p- people have done some analytics, haven't they, of um, dormant wallets? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, 25 to 40% is estimated to be lost forever. Um, and then you've kind of got longer term kind of hodlers that can make up a large amount. Um but as such, price is only determined by kind of liquid demand and supply. Everything else, in the short term anyway, is irrelevant and long term. And um, yes, it does kind of, um, yeah, kind of have an impact. But in the kind of mm-hmm. short term, like it's all about um, kind of liquid demand and supply. Um, people that have been jumping on exchanges have been the good people that have bought this year. The long term holders have scooped up about three uh, billion worth of Bitcoin um, as the price fell. Um, but whether there's still enough ex well demand versus supply to kind of keep it um, or to send things back up is kind of a question. Okay, because it, it's interesting. I was just looking at but Bitcoin's dominance of the overall market has now dropped down to around about forty one percent, which you know if it carries on on that downward trend, it's not going to be dominant for much longer. And it was interesting someone mentioned before about like institutional buyers moving into this space. Well, if the institutional buyers are moving in, but Bitcoin's dominance is dropping, does that mean that the whole market is exploding? Or is it that the institutional buyers are also buying altcoins as well? Has anyone got any thoughts on that? They're buying Ethereum, that's for sure. Um, There's been a lot of talk um around ethereum and i know i'm not like i think it's a bit hasty to talk about the flipping him but um I'm, you're seeing ethereum is starting to perform differently to bitcoin so today mm. when i was looking at, at the 15 minute markets today and i was looking at um ethereum was making a better recovery than bitcoin which suggests to me there's a slight deviation and why would there be a slight deviation when we've got digital gold and digital oil and they used to be so well linked well, it can only mean that <clears throat> institutions are adopting Ethereum at a faster rate than they were before, because Ethereum at the moment is a bargain. And there's been, you know, talks, talks of price predictors of like what, eight times as much as it will be by the end of this bull run. And if that's the case, well, the returns are far higher. Ethereum's a really easy sell as well to institutions, because, you know, at first they might think, well, Bitcoin. But when, you know, they're, they're given the basic metaphor that Ethereum is digital oil, and there's a lot more blockchain activity and it does far more and it has a far wider use, well, then the institutions are going to start buying up at a far faster rate. So I, I don't know if the flipping will happen within this bull run. It certainly could do. And a very nice uh, metric is the, on, is the on-chain volume. 
uh, between it's like Ethereum is now I think slightly above Bitcoin on a daily daily volume rate. Now that is very telling. So I'm quite bullish on Ethereum. I've I've bought I've bought uh, a sizable amount of my my bitcoins, uh, not bitcoins, of my <coughs> altcoins, altcoins in uh, Ethereum. So what what you thinking? Why do you think? What what is it that makes you think that it's institutional investors moving into Ethereum? And it's not just uh, Crypto Kitties version two or NFTs that are t- taking up the volume at the moment. Uh, if, if I'm going to be brutally honest, it's just from watching. I've subscribed to about ten different YouTubers, and I watch their videos every single day. And when yeah. nine out of ten start saying the same thing, well, I'm thinking, well, you know, this is, you know, it's like if, if Coin Bureau is is saying it, and he's really, really educational and the hot, probably the best quality person on on YouTube. And BitBoy, who's a complete hype man, but you know knows the market really well. If yep. those two have got the biggest, who've got the widest range of YouTube uh, views on on YouTube, and they're saying the same thing, I'm inclined to think on the balance of probabilities that is true. So okay. I'm just sourcing my information from them and and different and different blogs. So I mean, I'd like I don't know what institutions are. I can tell you for Bitcoin that um, developing economies are buying are hoovering it up on metrics. Yeah, you know, they're they've been hoovering up during this dip. Mm-hmm. Egypt, um, Ar- Argentina, um, lo- lots of South American and developing countries across the world have been buying bit- have been buying Bitcoin Bitcoin in this dip as well. Yeah. As, and in as fact, did, did, did you see the announcement yeah. at the Bitcoin conference over in the states? Was it yesterday? El From Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're going to make Bitcoin. Uh, is it the reserve currency or something? The, it, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. We know how politicians are. They want something. So when the guy gets something, you know, he's going to, oh, yeah. That's what I think, you know. But I'm very skeptical about politicians in general, you know. So uh, he's, he wants something either from the U.S. or from somewhere, someone, you know. And that's a way for, to destabilize him everything to get what he wants, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing when they've done that in the past, though. You get visitors from guys in uniform who... Come for a holiday for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. He's got an so 80% talking... um, majority, though, in Congress, in his Congress. So, yeah. you know. So, just one comment to what you said, Samuel. I agree. There's a lot. There's, Ethereum has smart contracts, right? So, that's why there's a lot of adoption, you know. And it's going to increase, uh, I hope, you know. But uh, the whole thing about V2 has been going for six years. And now it looks like, you know, I. I've been talking with people. I don't think it's going to be even in end end of 2022, and that could be a problem for Ethereum, you know. Um, and Polkadot and and I don't know Cosmos, that that type of blockchains, and you know maybe also Cardano, which is to me looks like more a white paper still, you know. That's there's nothing working there. But the the, the Critical thing that I, I've been asking to people, you know, and I was at a, the IBC in Dubai and I, I met quite a few people that um, are big guys in Ethereum. And I told them, it, it's very simple, tell me which which company, startup, yeah, is actually making profit, yeah? Uh, and nobody could mention one. Take the token aside, yeah? Take the token aside from every single company that has anything on Ethereum and tell me which one does actually make a profit. You know, there's a lot of stuff in DeFi, but it's collateralized loans. It's basically, if you really think, well, those are pyramids, yeah, (laughs) in my opinion, because if you don't have new people coming in, it's just everything falls apart. Yeah. So fundamentally, I don't see any company at the moment, that doing uh, actually achieving significant profit, and yes, we are in the beginning. Mm. So that's going to dictate the combination of V2 coming out and companies actually start to provide real services and having users on board and you know making profit not from the token and from crypto, you know uh, volatility. Then I think Ethereum and Polkadot I think have a big chance to become the dominant one. Yeah. You know? So what was the was there an announcement the other day that V2 had been pushed back again? I, I, th- I thought I saw something yeah, on social media about that. 
it's already it was already in the roadmap, but you know, people are just picking up on something that Vitalik said in Hong on some Hong Kong conference, you know. Okay. Hey, I see we've got the second Chris has joined us. Welcome back, Chris. <laughs> and he's, he's staying on mute for now. Never, never mind. No problem. Okay. Uh, so speaking of Cardano. Yep. Speaking I'm of sorry. Cardano. I, I couldn't find yeah. the unmute button. Okay. Um, that, that they, they're rolling out their smart contracts this summer. Um, did you see a really interesting bit of news? Um, the EU has um, got a relationship with is is it IH Hong Kong? What well, I got Cardano's um, kind of like parent IOH, company. K, IOH K. Yeah, IOH yeah. K. They they they're actually doing work with the EU at this point. I don't know why this news has been so suppressed. Um, but um, I don't know how it hasn't gone bigger across like the Cardano balls. Maybe they don't know. But they but they they they're, they're forging um, a like blockchain technology for private private identification. Um, within the EU, which would be voluntary, but if Cardano could get into into the EU doing that, that's a that's that's a big big jump, surely. So it's massive, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm shaking my head on that one because I've I've seen this kind of story several times in the past. Okay. That, <laughs> um, so the the EU they've got the EU blockchain observatory where they're running a, a whole range of things at the moment and that as well. They, they will be engaging with any number of organizations. They'll be building partnerships, whatever, with Cardano, with R3, with, with all the usual players. So I, I always say be cautious when you see a press release of X is working with Y, because sometimes it might just be that, that they've agreed to talk to each other or, or meet each other. I wouldn't actually read that much into it. Because I, okay. I, I see this a lot um, with blockchain projects, particularly, which I know are a, a level below crypto, that quite often you'll find companies are just exploring things. And the, the EU is trying to figure out a whole load of stuff right now. They're trying to look at uh, setting up a Europe-wide blockchain repository for doing research across. So th things like pharmaceutical research, that could all go on the same thing. So they're looking at that. And looking at central bank digital currency equivalents or a, a, a digital euro. So that there's a whole load of things. So it may be that not so much that the news was suppressed, but that it may not be quite as big news as some people think it might be. But that's my thinking on it. I think you're right, Gary. And I, I, I met uh, in Dubai, uh, I always meet him, you know, Ben Gartzel from Singularity. Yeah? And he's quite happy, actually, um, doing... Uh, they are on the test program, yeah, of Cardano, yeah? And they seem to be quite happy, you know, what what's going on. And he couldn't tell me much, but I actually dropped a note to, to Charles, you know, I know him for a while, and uh, I'm going to get... He actually gave me the contact from the business development director. I'm going to get also on the testing program because I want to... I want to see if they've managed to get some of the issues resolved with speed, et cetera, transactions per second and so on. But most of these blockchains suffer suffer of a problem, you know, uh, which actually Cosmos have fixed, yeah, which is, uh, you know, with Cosmos, you can spin up your own block blockchain, yeah. But when they released Stargate, I think it was in March, then that allows your blockchain to talk to mine at the same speed. So there's no, well, almost the same. There's almost no degradation, you know, at all. So uh, I think some of them, I, I think Cardano has that on the roadmap. But if we don't solve this problem, you know, the interoperability between blockchains, you know, multi-chain type of uh, approaches, mm -hmm. you know, then I think we're going to enter the next two years in some very serious issues for the, the ecosystem in, in general, you know. We might see some of these projects to drop as fast as, as they came up, you know. But that's where I've said for a long time that it, but the blockchain war is a bit like the VHS Betamax Philips 2000 war of years ago, that actually the, the real winner out of that was not VHS. The real winner was whoever came up with that idea of that SCART connector on the back of the TV set, which <laughs> meant you could plug any of them in. <laughs> and so you, you're right, inter interoperability, which is what Polkadot offers, it's what Cosmos offers, 
is definitely hopefully a way forward. But then you, you've got more fundamental problems. And this is where you, you get techie people who think of things from a techie perspective. Actually, if I've got a blockchain that is running on you know, Cosmo, uh, sorry, EOS, for example, and it's an insurance blockchain, and I've got insurance data structured in a certain way, and then I want to connect it with a R3 blockchain, which is running uh, derivatives, financial derivatives or something, it doesn't matter that you can get the ones and zeros to talk to each other. They're both going to be using different standards for the industries anyway. So I, I'm, I'm not quite convinced about interoperability yet because I think people are thinking of it purely from the atomic swap level and not from the business interoperability level, which is what will stumble well, a lot of them. I don't know what, what, what people's thinking on that. Let's say one thing that you can build your, yourself, you know, what you need is that tech to work and that interoperability, and then you can build all of that business side on top of it. I don't think blockchains will do all for you. But well, that's where you need standards. You, you need standards on all these things. It's funny, I'm involved in a load of stuff in the insurance sector, and we're trying to work out just how many standards there are in insurance, because there's loads and loads of them. So it, it's a real kind of pain on that. So anyway, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Well, I want to switch the conversation a little bit around more. Um, anyone got any interesting thoughts around any particular cryptocurrencies at the moment? I think we mentioned um, Shiba Coin earlier on um, and Doge. Doge, well, I guess that's just whichever um, Elon Musk wants to tweet about on a given day. But anyone watching any other cryptos at the moment? Silence. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to reveal before they they want to buy first. You know? yeah. Chain link, chain link, chain link. Go on, tell, yeah. tell us more. Well, I've got a friend who's a crypto millionaire and his advice was go all in on Chainlink. He's quite bullish, but, you know, he's done done quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, he he got, in, got in early days and he's got like four houses and a couple of mil. <laughs> so he, his, his advice to me, I went to university with him and his advice to me was to go all in on Chainlink. I'm looking at the um, at, at what he does. It, it's, again, it's a, it has a slightly different role, um, but the, the, like as compared to like um, Ethereum and Bitcoin, again, it has it has a different function. Mm. It's, a different, it's a different type of coin. <clears throat> but the, the thing to fear with that um, is that the the developers have like the whale share um, of it. So when the price goes higher, um, say if it does do a say if this bull run just goes really crazy, you're looking at a good sizable egg if if you're into chain link, like a far higher yield reward. Um, and obviously with Ethereum and Bitcoin or even Cardano, it can really uh, go go far higher. But the, the fear is that the, when, when it does go up to that level, the whales will pull out and sink the price. So it could sink before the end of the bull run um, okay. quite a lot more quickly. So that's that's my kind of fear with it. But I did put, I did put some money on it as, as un, under advice. But I put money in it when we were up to 60K. So I've got in a right exactly the right. <laughs> the wrong time, which was especially frustrating as I convinced my wife to put a good portion of our life savings in. But I, there we go. Well, I always say that I only trust the advice of people who've got three things. And, and several of the people on the call who know me will know what those three things are by now. But it's I only trust anyone who's made money out of crypto and they've made enough money out of it to own three things. And those three things are a private island, <laughs> a private jet, and a private uh, yacht, so it's, it sounds like he's at least heading the right way. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a start. Well, there are there, I, Gary, to let you know that the I know the third miner of Bitcoin. Okay, yeah, he doesn't own a house. Okay, he doesn't own a car. He rents his house. He rents his car because everything he has is in crypto. He believes mm -hmm. so much in the centralization in crypto and mainly Bitcoin, yeah, but he's invested in a lot of other projects. And, you know, it's the same as CZ, by the way. CZ doesn't, from Binance, he doesn't own a house, he doesn't own a car. Yeah. You, you know, if, if you look at that guy that bought people, the Indian guy, you know, uh, Meta Kovan, the same yeah. thing. Yeah, he rents everything, he doesn't own any, anything. So, 
these are the true believers, you know. I, I don't think that. Uh, <laughs> I know you did it. You said it as a joke, but you know, sometimes yeah. people have that type of profile of people. But I don't. I think the true, the true whales in crypto are the guys who don't have everything in crypto, really. Yeah, they don't I, even I, own I, that. I think you. I think you. 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 You're right on that, and as, as well, if you look at um, some of the people who we we both know in the crypto world. I mean, you, you probably mm -hmm. bumped into a couple out in Dubai last week where that they don't actually own a property. They just travel around the world. Um, I, I know a couple who, whenever I get, have a chat with them on Zoom, it's like a which country are you in now type thing. It's yeah. like, oh, you know, I'm in Portugal at the moment, but I'm going to whatever. And you, you did you meet up with uh, Tony Vase when you were out there? Because he, he was out. Yeah, with, I met him. Yeah. And, uh, I met him, uh, sir. Uh, about three times, actually, you know. We had yeah. a good conversation. He uh, was he, heading he, to Miami. He seems to be just traveling the world all the time, but he's purely on Bitcoin, uh, and he sticks to that, and he knows what he knows type thing, which is kind of quite good. So, yeah, what, what I, I say about that, you know, owning a jet, owning an island, that, it is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's also reflective of how you get people who think they're crypto experts in a rising market. You get loads of people. That, that's why I liked it, at least, when Sam said, you know, 25th of October, this is what's going to happen, as opposed to people who've always told you how they got the prediction of what's already happened right, but they didn't tell me about it beforehand. So, you know, yeah. Anyone can predict what's already happened. Um, and, on, and on a rising market, it, it tends to be fairly easy. So it's kind of good. So, okay. So I have a, I have a tip. Yeah, uh, my tip for cryptos. I I I think you know this, Gary. I like one quite a lot, which is GLQ Graphic Link. Uh, so uh, Graph Link, yeah, because uh, they're quite um, they're quite uh, on a on a journey that I think they're going to capture a lot of people. So basically, it's kind of a Lego of. Of blocks that you can use interface that you drag to the screen and you can create your own automation, your own bots. Yeah, just by dragging all the functions that you have. Think about Lego Lego bricks, you know, you can put it all together and you have to pay with their, to use it to execute them that, uh, you have to do it with their own token here, yeah? which is a GLQ token. So I so think which they exchange have- So which exchange is that listed on? Because I just checked it on Binance and couldn't find it. Yeah, they're not on Binance. I think they are on Uniswap, they are on- uh, KuCoin, Gate.io, they're on a few, you know, you'll so see. It's, 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 so it's, it's more on like the DeFi zone, as you say, with them doing um, yield farming, that kind of thing. No, they don't do yield farming. I don't think they do yield farming, but they are really, you You can create your own bots, basically. You know? So for example, you can, they have, <laughs> um, they have functions like to monitor an RS, uh, RSS feed, you know, and look for keywords like SEC and XRP and whatever, yeah? And you can, you can, they have integration with Binance, so you can actually monitor cryptos. If they're going up or going down, you can actually then execute things like buy and sell orders, you know, based on certain keywords, based on certain conditions. And it's, uh, and I, I think that they have an amazing future, to be truly honest, you know, because, I haven't seen any project that is doing that properly, you know? Okay. So that's one of them. Yeah. Um, and there's more than that. When I was looking at them, I'm actually uh, an early investor in them. So just for disclosure, okay? And there's, an, there's another one uh, that um, I've been looking at and I got already in at the bar because they dropped quite a lot. And BitBoy was was actually a while back but you know bitboy and all these guys they only like to they buy early and then they pump it and then they dump it you know <laughs> that's what happened to apy so apy um, ah, yeah. i think it's apy.finance i think these guys uh have been backed by the same guys that uh invested in uniswap so they're still finalizing their platform, yeah? So I think some people just pump, you know, it happened in January, February and so on, they, they just pump it up. Uh, and uh, he went to about six or $7. 
And then, you know, of course, that's what the, some of the, the guy, I'm not saying BitBoy did this, by the way, okay? You know, I, I'm pretty sure that he's, he behaves well, but I'm very skeptical about some YouTubers and when they come and they talk a lot about a crypto and someone definitely dumped it and it came down very fast, you know? And um, and I'm not saying it was the, the, the YouTubers, okay? Uh it's just I don't like sometimes when they talk and everybody comes and buy because what happens is at some point there's a dump, you know, and that yeah. hurts a lot of projects. And I think it hurt this project quite a bit, you know. So I'm keeping an eye on them. I'm not saying this is going to be amazing, successful, but I suggest you guys, if you're interested, just I think on their website. Uh, I, by the way, I only got in about uh, a week ago, yeah. Uh, uh, I never bought this token. I just kept an eye until it, it, it went really down so I could buy in. I like okay. to buy when they low, you know. So uh, <laughs> just subscribe to their newsletter because every Friday they send a newsletter with what they have achieved already. And then you have a feeling more or less when they're going to probably when they're going to be ready to for the investors to come very strong, you know, to the project. Okay. Uh, I was, I was so just those, trying to get I was just trying to get APY's data up at the moment. Uh as is always the case, whenever you try and do this live, the system runs slow. So we'll give up on that. Okay. Yeah. So a a APY and um, what was Yeah, just keep an eye on, the, on those two. Yeah. Okay. For now. Uh, so. And as always, say to people in this group, you know, we don't offer recommendations or financial advice or anything like that. We just talk about what we're finding of interest. By uh, the way, just very, just very quickly, for example, just to give you an example, GLQ, I think it's about, I can't remember, last time I looked was four cents or five cents, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, uh, the competitor that has a lot less, and you will understand why, uh, their competitor is uh, the graph, yeah? I think mo some of you might have heard, so the graph uh, reached, I think, about three dollars, yeah? And their, and their market cap is about four times or sorry total token supply is four or five times of glq so glq is right in the beginning and they do a lot more than the graph really a lot more you know so the potential for the, the glq is tremendous you know uh, okay. you can make easily you know 20 30 40 50 x if if there's a big if you know if this goes in the right direction because the tech is good and you can actually validate it yourself. You can actually uh, play with it. Go to their website and you see it. You know, it's very, very interesting. Okay. Well, GLQ's graph link, yeah? Yeah, correct. Okay, okay. So, uh, so GLQ and AP1, what we're looking at for them. Okay. Sorry, someone's rustling at the moment and I'm struggling with that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, anyone got any other th things that they're looking at at the moment? Because I think both APY and GLQ are both in the DeFi space, really, aren't they? That w when you start talking about things like Lego bricks are plugging things together and c composable things now, is anyone looking at anything else at the moment? Or is it that plus Bitcoin plus Ethereum? Peter, what do you what want to do? Do you want to know a, a new shit coin that people have been? Uh, Talking a lot in Dubai, and they went to the to the Bitcoin conference. Actually, all of them. Oh, not, not Dubai coin. No, no, no. <laughs> they sent me this the other day. A big B Z O G E. B E Z O G E. Okay, Fernando, your lines crack. Your your uh, microphone's uh, awful at the moment. Yeah, B Z O G B E Z O G E. Okay, uh, so I didn't buy any of it because I don't I don't get into shit coins. To be truly honest, you know, it's not my thing. Okay, so uh, but it's been talking a lot, you know, and they're very strong with the, at the moment with all the stuff they're doing. So I don't know. Okay, so wh Sorry, when you when you were out there, did any did anyone actually talk about Dubai coin, which was probably a scam? Uh, I, I don't know. But it was allegedly, they, they claimed it was connected with um, the Emirati and uh, becoming an official token for use in Dubai. And no. I saw a, a massive hype because I'd, I'd not heard of it before. 
and they seemed to launch the same week as the conference was on, and then it no, just disappeared. It's fake. Okay. It's fake. Uh, not, it's not fake. It actually exists. Mm -hmm. It was created uh, some years back, and the people who did it completely abandoned the project. Uh, and this was told to me by the CISO of the uh, government of Dubai. Okay? okay, so he told me, and he said, "This is somebody that created some website, right? To to pump these, and they probably capturing your e email, the usual stuff. Then to try to to send you fake emails and try to get your wallet. It's it's a, a scam, basically." Okay, okay, it's a, a good one to know because it, it gets pretty hard at times to figure out what's fake and what's real because some of the Real ones are so crazy in their own right. So <laughs> that's the one. What about Telcoin? Has anyone yeah. been uh, following Telcoin? Um, in the Bank of Nebraska has adopted it into legislation or something. Or some, or so, um, I've got a friend in America when I started my crypto journey. She's she's she got into it pretty early, and she's she's made a sizable um sizable X on it, like from like four hundred dollars to like forty thousand dollars. So she's like, Obviously, quite happy with it. She got quite excited about it, but telling me that it's been adopted by the Bank of Nebraska. It's gone into legislation there. So, um, what's, and she, what's her name? What's her name? No, 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 the, the, coin, the name so, of the coin. Telcoin. Telcoin. Yeah. From Telecom. Yeah. Tel Telcoin. Yeah. Yeah. So that that one seems to have gone up, and it seems to she seems to think it's it's going to hit a dollar, which be would be like a massive uh, increase from where it is now so she, she's but I, I think she's got into it nice and early she's got most of the x yield already i don't i don't know how much higher it, it, it can go but she's quite confident of it boosting further and then i checked it out on the internet and the press is saying that it has been adop adopted by the bank of nebraska which seems to be quite too you know that a bank would adopt a coin so oh, why the bank say, th that that sounds a bit weird that I, I know Nebraska has recently passed some legislation, I think it was about three weeks ago, mm. which was more to do with digital asset custody, which a, a lot of the other states are doing at the moment as well. Um, so I, it would, uh, as you say, it would seem strange for a bank itself to be adopting crypto, um, certainly within the US, because the, the, the US is very festooned with federal and state regulations on crypto and that mm. at the moment. But uh, another one to check out. So thanks for that. You know, it's, it's a problem we, ne we never really know with some of these. Sometimes they appear out of nowhere. And mm. you know, it's, it's like the Bitcoin announcement with El Salvador. You know, it suddenly pops up and you go, yeah, was that someone just putting a joke tweet out? Or was it really that El Salvador is officially adopting Bitcoin or whatever? So it, it's always useful on these calls to, to get that thing. Th thanks for that. I, I like looking at uh, coins that are trying to, or businesses that are trying to solve problems um, in the existing market. And I've just been spending quite a lot of time on an injective protocol. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us more, Chris. Well, it's, it, it's handling it within the DeFi market. It's trying to create a, a derivatives market with no barriers. Okay. So what's kind of different or unique what as you say what problem is it trying to solve um well like so many of them um i think they're creating the problems themselves that they're trying to solve <laughs> but it's no it's it's just another um to, to me it's it i what i would really like is something that allows people to trade freely with fiat currencies and and get money in and out without any broad hassle mm. um and that's to me. Uh, I, I, I'm always looking at the at companies that are setting up to try and do that more efficiently. So I, I think you're looking at exactly the right thing, but you're looking on exactly the wrong side of the fence. Because because I, I, I suspect what we're going to end up with is a total crypto economy at some point, where you're not going to yes, worry I'm about sure. you're not going to worry about talking with fiat. You, you're just going to keep it within within the crypto side. But then that's the crypto libertarian in me talking. But I, I agree at the moment, you, you look at the challenge, there's been a fair amount of press this week in the UK about banks and crypto. And yeah. I'm, I'm seeing this old conversation coming out again about money laundering, blah, 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 blah. And I've heard a few conversations about people having a bit of problems with their banks, linking them to um, Coinbase or Binance and 
getting fiat payments through in there. So I, th I think you're right. There is a problem with that gateway. I think regulatory wise, it might become a bigger problem for a while. Because it was interesting that the UK FCA, um, that they've got a crypto asset register now, which companies who, if they're even dealing in crypto on the retail market, yet you have to be registered with. And they've delayed the final implementation of that. They announced the other day by a further six months because they've got so many applications to come through and so on. So I think they've either turned down or companies pulled out about 61 companies so far who were registered to become on this list and have now pulled away. So I just fear that the FCA is going to get a bit harder on that. And then they're going to start saying things to banks and that as well. Yeah, I think, I think that's quite right. But I think one of the problems is that the banks themselves are quite worried about losing the laundering ability that uh, crypto might be able to provide. Mm. <laughs> I think that's a realistically accurate version of uh, exactly the opposite of what, of course, they're saying, because they're always saying that, you know, crypto is used for money laundering, that's black, bad, blah, 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 blah. But then you actually look at all the big banks and all they do, they when they see a money laundering or suspected activity, they raise what's known as a SAR, so a suspicious activity report, and they let the transaction happen anyway. It's like so. It's a bit like saying, "Yeah, we've we've done our job. That we've admitted that we think this might be money laundering. You know that that Mexican bank that had to have the extra tills installed to handle the cash in the the suitcases. Yeah, we thought that was suspicious, but we've reported it. So that's our job done. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, it's so disappointing to see the, you know that thing last week, Gary. You know about the FCA. I was really, really disappointed. You know mm -hmm. because. I'm I'm trying to set up a company now uh, for something new that I'm doing, you know. And if you guys want to hear, I, I can tell you in a couple of minutes. Yeah, I'm not pitching to anyone, but uh, I am going to probably register the company in the in Dubai at the mm -hmm. MCC because they are creating all the crypto related laws, you know. And the STO are already almost kind of finished. Yeah, and uh, I know at least three guys from UK that are already um, setting up company here. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's what's going to happen. People want to continue their projects. And I think the UK is going to lose a lot, you know. Yeah. It's quite, uh, quite, quite incredible, you know. I, I think it's certainly a risk. And you, you would have thought at the moment that the UK would be doing all it can to pr protect the retail. But first of all, that's fair enough, you know, protect your customer, but to make mm -hmm. uh, this area an attractive area um, to, to bring things on. But it, it's weird that they have hot and cold days. You know, sometimes they're very supportive of crypto and then they'll come up with some announcements or whatever, of, you know, the, the old Christine Lagarde crypto is evil type of thing. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where it goes. Or the Bank of England, big boss, you yeah. know, sometimes it comes out. Being negative about crypto, you know. So, well, well he did say there they... is. <laughs> go on, go on, Sam, go for it. Are, are they looking to develop their own gov coins anyway? There's, um, you know, that that seems to be like there's a lot of noise well, around that. Competition. <laughs> oh. Yeah. yeah. So, like... so they they are looking at that. In fact, they they've just closed their applications for the, the Bank of England is doing a load of um, research at the moment. They've got two groups that are setting up. And they were looking for volunteers to help sit on these panels. And the applications on that closed a few days ago. So the Bank of England is doing some stuff around central bank digital currency. But I've, I've been on a number of calls listening to what they're doing on that. And people mix up central bank digital currency with cryptocurrency. They yeah. are similar, but they are different. You know, the, the very nature it's centralized for start it mean, it means it's not a true crypto. So I think what they're looking at doing, and they've said it said it before now, and I want to tech guys in the B of A, they're looking at using some of the features that you see in a cryptocurrency or in a blockchain, or it won't be a cryptocurrency. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Guys, the, the, the time's flown by. We're down to the last 60 seconds. I, I always try and do a, a hard stop on these, otherwise they, they just kind of wind on. So I, I was going to say, unless anyone's got any absolutely urgent news 
I, I was going to close today's session down and thank you all for coming along, joining in. I hope you found it of interest. Come again. What you know, we, we do this every Sunday. Um, if you can't, I remember it, another. I remember another coin for you guys. Standard. Go standard on. protocol. Standard protocol. What, what's the code for it, JP? STND, yeah. So it's a it's a CRS, you know, a, a collateralized rebasable stable coin, yeah. Okay. And it's for synthetic assets, uh, and it's it's pretty much for the Polkadot ecosystem. Yeah? It operates across the entire Polkadot ecosystem. Okay. Uh, so that- with this recent recent uh, crypto dropped, they didn't drop too much because the people I think they invested on them, they kind of believe in it quite quite a lot, you know. So could be okay. good. All right, a good one to close off then. So STND. So there, there we go, guys. We had a few calls mentioned today. STND. Yeah. So there we go. Had a few coins mentioned. Hope that was interesting to people to listen in. Um, hopefully we covered everything off. Thanks for coming along. Join us again next week. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, Gary. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Gary. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.